The opening round of the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe powered by AWS Sprint Cup is here at Brands Hatch. We're in the sunshine. We're on the full Grand Prix circuit. And this is a proper old school circuit. It's got ups and downs. It's got barriers close to the edge of the circuit. It's a real driver's track and it's one that can bite. There is no margin for error. It's also relatively narrow, and that's put the onus on the teams throughout qualifying. A good grid position is absolutely essential as we get set for the first 60-minute blast of a whole new season of GT3 Sprint Racing. Welcome to the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS Sprint Cup, where star drivers in supercar brands go head-to-head -head in the fiercest GT competition. So, how does it work? There are five events with two races at each. The races last for one hour and each car has two drivers. So there's a mandatory pit stop in a window between 25 and 35 minutes of the race in which every team must change drivers and change all four tires. Those pit stops can be done as fast as possible in the pro and silver classes, putting the emphasis on the pit crew as races can be won or lost in the pits. All the cars run to international GT3 regulations, but then divided by driver grading. The pro class is for the real stars. Many are manufacturer paid drivers, and the winners are most likely to come from here. The Silver Cup is for the young guns, up and coming but less experienced or successful, while Pro-Am is just that, an amateur racer partnered by a pro as the gun for hire. There are 26 cars from six different brands, and it means there are battles throughout the field in 60 minutes of high-octane drama. So who do we look for for a win this weekend? Charles Weir's partners Dries Van Thor, and the pair of them have won the Sprint Cup for the last two seasons. Once more aboard a WRT Audi, they're looking for three in a row. It's a really special track. Uh, it's not often you have such uh, elevation changes, uh, but uh, no, I really like it. It's old school, so you don't have the right to a mistake. So yeah, it's going to be nice. I enjoy it. We know it's a good track for the Mercedes, so we'll try to, to be on, in the mix with them and uh, yeah, just try to gather as much points as we can. We had again a great start of the year here in Imola in Endurance where we won the race and uh, we'll just try to keep up that form. WRT is for sure one of the best team on the grid and it's uh, for sure a lot of pleasure to drive with them and uh, let's try to, to make another success with them. Another key brand represented on the grid is McLaren and the 720S was really quick around Brands Hatch last season. In qualifying this year, life is a little bit more challenging The driver, Ollie Wilkinson. Yeah, we're looking good. I think the car went from strength to strength last year, having our highest ever Spa 24 finish and nearly had our highest ever race finish and first race win here, but unfortunately that didn't quite go to plan. So we'll be looking to build off the back of that this weekend and see if we can get her up on the podium. Brand number three, step forward, Porsche. The dynamic motorsport team fields two cars, and one is hustled along by the Belgian driver, Adrian Delina. He's back in harness after injuring himself at Masano last year, and he's up for the challenge. I mean, luckily we were at Nordschleife last week, so it's a little bit of a similar track uh, in terms of, let's say, the runoff areas and how the, the constellation of the track is. Um, I think some simulator running. We've all been on the sim in the team, so we have an idea of where we're going, and now it's about dialing in the car and making sure that we have the best package we can. I mean, ideally, we will be somewhere in the middle of the points. That's what we're aiming for. We finished the season really strongly last year. We had a close podium result in Zandvoort, had the car not failed on us. So I think we have a good package uh, between the drivers as well as the team and the car. So hopefully we'll put it all together in time for the race. Jules Gounon was a star two weeks ago in the UK in the opening British GT Championship round, and here he is at another good old school circuit for the Akodis ASP Mercedes team, looking for a victory. Those UK tracks are amazing. I had so much fun in Utland Park two weeks ago. It's the same track, you know, it's uh, grass and then straight the wall, so you need to respect the place, go step by step to the limit, closer to closer. And uh, yeah, it's, it's an amazing place. Last year went well. We did P3 with Razman Numa High School, my teammate last year. But like you said, it was an eventful race. So let's try to stay out of trouble this year, do great qualification, and then uh, we try to send it for the race. A potential winning team in the Silver Cup is Sky Tempesta Racing. They've switched from Ferrari to Mercedes for this year, and that poses new challenges for Eddie Cheever and Chris Froggart. 
You know, everyone knows the sprint championship is extremely competitive, like the endurance, but here there's even less margin for error. The races are only an hour long, so you know, you've got to make the absolute most of it. And it, it probably a more aggressive style of racing here. New car, so yeah, absolutely a lot to learn in the new car, and we're still getting to grips with it, but I feel over time we'll definitely get there. And here at sort of my home track, I feel quite comfortable, so fingers crossed we have good pace. Another brand to keep an eye to is Lamborghini. There are examples from GSM, Nova Marine and also Barwell Motorsport. Ben Barker has made a name for himself in Porsches, but for this year, he switches brands. He's aboard a raging bull. I'm new to the GTR Challenge and I did Imola, which is the first round of endurance, which was hectic. You know, 52 cars or so, bumper to bumper, it's pretty crazy. So I think first objective is to stay out of trouble. Uh, and secondly, yeah, get a good result at the end of it. You know, we're in Pro-Am. Which is, uh, which is very competitive this year. So I think if we can come away fighting for the championship at the end is obviously a perfect and ideal uh, situation. But um, we're driving a Lamborghini, it, it, seems, it seems pretty fast, it's fun to drive. Yeah, I think uh, it's an exciting challenge ahead. Another car to keep an eye to, indeed another battle to keep an eye on, is in Pro-Am, where this McLaren of Garage 59 should star. Miguel Ramos is a perennial racer in the championship, joined by newcomer Dean McDonald, the Scotsman eager to go racing. Yeah, I think everyone enjoys this place, don't they? When you go out in the GP, um, yeah, it's great to drive. And yeah, I've done a few races here already, so a bit of experience. So I was in this car in British GT a few years back, um, and actually with Garage 59, the first year I raced. So yeah, a few familiar faces, and yeah, look forward to getting started again with them. I think it will be competitive. Uh, working out last year at this race, uh, McCormick's on pole. Um, so yeah, um, it all goes well, I think. Hopefully we should be there as well. Remember too that these European races make up part of the global Fanatec GT World Challenge powered by AWS. The brands scoring points in Europe, America, Australasia and Asia. Currently it's Audi that has the advantage over Mercedes AMG with Porsche in third place. But two good results here in Europe this weekend could radically shake up the order. So the grid here at Brands Hatch is formed and we are looking forward hugely to this first Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe powered by AWS Sprint Cup opener. It is a 25 strong field because we are sadly without one car. I'll come to that in a few moments. Uh, John Watson and David Addison are trackside and down on the grid is Gemma Scott and she is with the man most people have come to see Gemma. It's Valentino Rossi. Bella, if we can just interrupt you for a moment. Wonderful to have you here. A sea of yellow around Brands Hatch. It's a real pleasure to see so many fans for you. But your first time here, how are you enjoying the circuit? Yes, yeah, the, the, the circuit is, uh, is fantastic. Uh, it's, uh, it's very particular, very fast, uh, and it's, uh, it's good. And uh, thanks to all the fans, because uh, here in the UK, I have always a big, big support in all my career, and also today. So it's great to see, to see all the people. Absolutely. And of course, we're here at 17th on the grid. There's a bit of work to do, maybe a little bit daunting into Paddock Hill Bend. I don't know. Don't think what's I mean. Well, there's a lot of work to do and perhaps a lot of cars yeah, in front of you in anticipation. Yeah, they, they are my friend in front. They, they <laughs> let me pass. <laughs> You've done a deal with them. Yes. <laughs> what's it like to, for the fans that don't know this circuit either to go into Paddock Field Bend, that drop down as a driver? It yes. must feel quite incredible. Yes, it's incredible because uh, so the track is very narrow, don't have a lot of curb, and also you have a lot, a lot of up and down. Uh, so exit from the first corner when you go down and you come up, it's like you remain without a Breathe, you know, and especially you have a lot of blind corner, and uh, and is uh, is very difficult. You need to take uh, to take the right uh, the right point uh, to entry. And your target for today? Uh, good question. Try to recover some uh, position, and we see. Thank you very much. Have a great race. Thanks, Valley. The sea of yellow is absolutely right because everywhere you look, there are Rossi fans. They were here on Friday, even though the cars weren't on track. They were trying to get a glimpse of the great man and an autograph. Uh, and we're going to have this John Watson all season. The Rossi effect is just immense. Well, David, I mean, I don't know what time you arrived at Brands Hatch, but I was here at a quarter of the seven and already looking behind us, South Bank was already filling up. And those fans are already looking forward to what promises to be a quite fantastic race as we get set uh, for the uh, countdown to continue. And uh, Ulysse Depau is the man on pole position. 
and uh, Jules Gounon will be the start driver lining up alongside him. 25 cars, as I say, the Barwell Lamborghini, sadly, of Ben Barker and Alex Malakin has had to withdraw. Alex Malakin is uh, not uh, t feeling terribly well, so that car has had to be withdrawn. So 25 we will have. Mandatory pit stops, of course, as ever, and it is absolutely flat out. We'll touch also on the fact that the different classes get a point for that pole position. So uh, Elise de Pau and Pierre Alexandre Jean in silver, Jules Gounon, Jim Pla in pro, and Louis Machiels and Andrea Bertolini in pro am are already one point to the good. Plus, of course, you naturally get finishing points as well. Uh, Weather-wise, the sun shines and the temperatures are going up. Yeah, the temperature right now is midway between when it was Saturday morning, nine o'clock, and where we ended up four o'clock on Saturday afternoon for qualifying. So it's a balmy 15 Celsius ambient and a slightly warmer 22 on track. That 22 is key because it means that when the cars make their parade lap, they're not going to lose quite as much temperature as they would have done in those earlier hours of Saturday morning. Let's go back down to the grid. Ulysse de Pau is the man on pole position. First time out in the Ferrari for AF Corsa. A mighty lap put him on pole position. Hugh, a fantastic qualifying session for you yesterday. Very proud moment for you with your number 53 Ferrari on the front row. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's an insane feeling. Uh, first pole position in GT World Challenge. First, with the f so first race with the Ferrari after only two test days. So uh, I was absolutely not expecting this, but uh, I will take it and uh, let's, let's do a, a good race now. Uh, we did a good quality, but the harder is still to come. It was great to see yourself and Pierre, of course, come and join us celebrating yesterday. Your face was a picture in the garage as your driver here put it on pole. Yeah, I want to congratulate my, my teammate. He did a brilliant job uh, yesterday. It was a bit more difficult for me, but uh, it pushed me to, to be good today and uh, push for the, for the races. So ready for the challenge ahead and uh, really looking forward to it. Well, great to see a Ferrari strong here at Brands. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Have a great race. They might be rookies to the car, John, but there was no real suggestion of that yesterday. A silver cup car on pole position outright. Great effort. I mean, to see the Ferrari first of all take pole position, but the Lucy de Paul did an outstanding job. And just the combination of Pierre Alexandre Jean, who didn't quite, maybe got a slightly overwhelmed by the performance of a Lucy de Pau in Q1. Nevertheless, they did enough to get this car on pole position for race one here this afternoon. But a lot of this is going to be down to the start. And can Elise de Pau fend them all off? Well, alongside is certainly a potential winner. Jules Gounon and Jim Pla share Mercedes 88. Let's hear from that crew with Gemma again. Jules, Jimmy, it's great to see you down here. Front row, pushing very, very hard yesterday. There wasn't a lot in it. Yeah, well, yesterday's yesterday. Uh, today is uh, what matters. And uh, we're going to give it a try. We have a very strong lineup here. So I'm going to try to get, to have a good start, see what happened there. And then depending on this, just trying to make a gap or not. And then trying to do a good pit stop. And Jim can finish the work. So feeling good. It's amazing. So many finds around the track. You know, it looks like Formula One when I went on the outlap was very nice. So it's good to see the people back, the fans back. COVID is a bit away, let's say, from us at the moment. So we see so many people. So it's great. So let's hope to have a great race. Well, I hope so indeed. Jim, is this a Mercedes track here at Brands? Yes, I think we are quite, quite OK here. Uh, look, the Audi looks good as well. So we will see uh, in the stint about the degradation and so on. But yeah, we'll try to, to focus on yourself and then we will see. There's a lot of undulation. Even stood here on the banking, you don't on the start finish line, you don't realize how much it sort of slopes downwards towards the pits. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's a difficult track uh, also for the pits, uh, like you said. But uh, yeah, it's really fun to, to drive here to to enjoy in T1 with a lot of banking and downhill. So, yeah, let's have a fun. Thank you. Have a great race, boys. In part, the answer to the question, is this a Mercedes circuit? Yes, but it's more of an Audi circuit. Mercedes have had four wins. Uh, this is the eighth visit of the Sprint Cup to Brands Hatch. Four to Mercedes and, in fact, Lamborghini, but six wins to Audi. Yeah, I mean, it is a racetrack. We're talking about the start-finish line. There you see it on picture, but what you don't really get is an idea of how much camber. Now, this is a rolling start rather than a standing start, so the advantage of being on the inside as opposed to being on the outside is negated. But let's have a look at this Brands Hatch circuit, 2.43 miles around it, 3.916 kilometres Short start, finish, run up into paddock, then up towards down Graham Hill Bend. I can't keep up with the graphic, it's going so quickly. And a finished a lap. Nine turns in total, plenty of undulation, and that sort of natural amphitheatre of the indie circuit before you go out into the woods. And you've got some good memories of this place as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I raced here, I think the first time was about 
Well, let's put it this way. It was in the 20th century, not the 21st <laughs> century. Uh, but it, it's always been a wonderful racetrack. And the thing I feel is that the circuit fundamentally has not changed. The layout is the layout that I raced, I think, 1971 in a Formula 2 race. And I mentioned yesterday, not a chicane in sight. No. I mean, how many racetracks of that age have remained fundamentally the same? The big change here this year, of course, David, as we know, we've had a lot of resurfacing around different parts of the racetrack. That's contributed to our new record qualifying time, along with a new Pirelli tyre for 2022. Now, the... Uh Third car on the grid is that of Matteo Drudi and Luca Giotto. Matteo Drudi starts. Luca, I think, is with Gemma. Luca, a great start to the weekend for you. The first Audi on the grid here. Yeah, Matteo did a great, great qualifying yesterday. Unfortunately, I was not able to repeat the result in my quali, but uh, I think to today we have uh, the chance to, to finish on the podium. We'll try our best. I think the start is important, but Matteo is always very good in these situations. And then we'll see. I mean, uh, you know, it's uh, quite a tight circuit. Uh, I think it's important to get away in the first lap uh, and then to do our pace. I mean, uh, with such, such a short practice time, I think nobody really knows where the others are in terms of pace. So it would be a bit of a discovery as we go now. Uh, yeah, we'll see. A lot of people up and down the, the paddock are talking about problems with tyres and, and getting the tyres to come on. Any struggles for you guys? Yeah, I think it's quite the, the same situation for everybody. They got a really small window to operate well, and yeah, it's uh, as I said. Also on this on this thing is quite a, always a discovery in progress. We're understanding things every lap, and I think it, this race will be important also on that side. Thank you, Luca. Have a great race. Thank you. So Luca Giotto will do the second stint, but of course will be the start driver for race two. DRU on the Lumirank display, the short code for the driver in the car, and that will flick between its position in the race and the driver's name. So on occasions you'll see the short code for the driver, on other occasions you will see where that car uh, is. It's to help the fans trackside to identify the race order as it gets more shuffled, especially after pit stop. So the grid now being cleared, and uh, there is the car of the reigning champions, indeed the 2020 champions. They're going for three Sprint Cup titles in a row, Charles Wirtz and Dries Van Thor. Well, anybody behind row two has got to be a patient and be very, very observant because the run up into Paddockle Bend, it's always a tough corner. There's a one line in and a one line out. Some will try and take the long way around and you, you could pay the price by ending up in the gravel. If you get a bit too greedy and dive down the inside, force the issue, you could have contact and remember, if you damage your car here, any level of damage, that's your race effectively over. And of course, there's the pit stop element to all of this. And these are, for the pros and the silvers, natural pit stops. In other words, as fast as you can do them. And year after year after year, it's WRT mechanics that win the award for the best pit stop. So that might just gain you a place if your pit crew is absolutely on the money. Well, if you aren't able to overtake on the racetrack, the next best place to make an overtake is by having a better pit stop than your competitors. And we've seen for season in, season out, in particular, WRT as being a team that masters that in our procedure. Well, there's the pole position car. Pressure is on Ulysse de Pau. He knows Brands Hatch because he's raced here in GTs. He's also raced here over a couple of seasons in the, as it was then called, uh, British Formula 3 Championship. There is Jules Gounon starting alongside. Now, he knows that Mercedes better than Ulysse de Pau knows the Ferrari. Is the smart money on Jules Gounon to lead into Paddock on the first lap? Who leads in is maybe less important than who <laughs> leads out. out. All right, yeah, fair point. Uh, Jules, vastly experienced Mercedes driver. He won the Spa 24 hours as an Audi driver uh, for Santa Lock. He's driven Bentleys. He's driven the Corvette in the ADAC GT Championship in Germany. Versatile driver and very much now part of the Mercedes fabric. He's got to skip next week's British GT race because he's needed at the Nordschleife. David, I know you're gagging to ask me who is going to be first out of <laughs> Panicle Ben and based on experience and uh, Jules Gunion he's come back from a weekend at Oulton Park not Oulton as he <laughs> pronounced it uh, I suspect that his experience his knowledge of Brands Hatch his knowledge of the Mercedes is probably tipping the balance in my view in his favour to be first out of paddock but you know that lots of things could take place on the run from this start line it's only about 300 metres up into the turn in point at Paddock Hill Bend Green flag wave then to release the cars on this formation lap. And as ever, in a GT grid, different shapes, different sizes, different sounds as well. And Valentino Rossi then, who starts 
17th on the grid here. His co-driver, Frederic Verbiche, did win at Brands Hatch back in 2018. But Valet has got a lot of work to do, and he's really thrown in at the deep end here. Yeah, and the onboard camera, I mean, I don't know how many shots we're going to get of Valentino on the opening lap, but certainly his concentration, you can see now just on this outlap, trying to get as much tyre temperature into the front tyres as possible, key to making sure you've got a clean start. Elise de Pau starts on pole position with Jules Gounon alongside Mathieu Drudy and Timur Bogoslavski share row two ahead of Charles Witz and Aurelien Panis. Gilles Magnus had a spin into the gravel yesterday but starts seventh alongside Peter Scotthorst with Simon Gachet and Thomas Drouet on row five. Row six is the Sky Tempesta Mercedes of Eddie Cheever. Nicholas Scherl is alongside him ahead of Jean-Baptiste Simonard and Ethan Simeone. Then it is Igor Walilko and Benjamin Goethe next. He starts 16th ahead of Valentino Rossi and the quickest car in Pro-Am. Louis Machiel starts in the Ferrari ahead of his teammate Hugo Delacour. Adrian Delina's Porsche ahead of Ollie Wilkinson's McLaren and uh, Giorgio Roda's dynamic motorsport Porsche. Patrick Kroprinski's McLaren's had brake dramas this weekend but starts 23rd. Miguel Ramos had problems yesterday but he's on the grid 24th and he's at Tutumlu's Lamborghini. Rounds out the order then. So 25 cars we have. And we pose the question, who's going to lead into and out of turn one? But even more important, who's going to lead at the end of the hour? And it is called the Sprint Cup for a very good reason. This is absolutely foot to the boards from the moment we go racing. Yes, the third row, Charles Vance, WRTID. Again, a driver who knows brands very well indeed. Familiar with the ID of three seasons behind the wheel. So there's back now to the 88 Mercedes. This is the car sharing the front row of the grid with the Ferrari. This is the Sky Tempest of you. Eddie Cheever is at the wheel of it, and uh, he is on the sixth row of the grid. And Valentino Rossi, we've already had a look at once, but there he is, a study of concentration. It is a rolling start for the uh, Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS, and therefore the cars don't stop on the grid. We go straight into the race. The race director, Alain Adam, uh, gives the instruction. The cars get themselves into the Noah's Ark two by two formation. The uh, leading car, as it is, will peel into the pit lane. And then it is up to Elise de Pau and Jules Gounod on the front row of the grid to control the pace. You can't really go racing until the lights change. If you do, then it's an anticipatory start. Penalties could come. But the opening round of the Sprint Cup is about to get underway. Jules Gounod has got his nose in front. So eager is he to get on with the job as the lights go green and we go racing. On the inside line is Elise de Pau. Gounod drops back a little bit as up the inside line goes Matthew Drudy. And there's carnage going into the first corner. Cars scatter everywhere. One Porsche is off. There are three cars in the gravel. There's one on the inside line. This is going to be a safety car for sure. Well, it all kicked off in the middle to the back of the field, turning in, and inevitably four cars into two, into one is never going to go. So a safety car immediately is being deployed. And uh, well, there's still uh, cars trying to get out of the gravel, but what a disappointing start to what was going to be a fantastic one hour of racing. Absolutely. Well, the only good news for some is that Valentino Rossi didn't get caught up in it. Elise de Pau survived and he leads Jules Gounod and look at the damage that he's done to the Audis. We've got two of the Audis off, certainly one Porsche. I thought there was a Mercedes that had gone off around the corner as well. It looks like a Santa Lock Audi. I'm trying to identify the other, but we'll try and piece this together. Right, we've lost Jean-Baptiste Simonard, we've lost Ben Goethe and we've lost Adrian Delina. They are the three. Well, it's going to take, what, 15, 20 minutes maybe to well, hopefully not as long as that, but to clear the entrance into Paddock Hill Bend, get the cars removed to safety. So the next minutes or so will all be behind safety car. We'll get tyre temperatures, tyre pressures, things that drivers are concerned about as they go around the, the pace of the safety car. That when this gets back to green flag racing, they are not going to be starting on tyres that have got that lack of temperature, lack of pressure. We'll try and piece it all together in due course. There was a Mercedes involved and it was Igor Walilko, number 86, who was mid-grid uh, and was badly delayed. So all of these laps count within the hour, but all of this has happened sort of round about the sixth, seventh, eighth rows of the grid. So it is Elise de Pau leading uh, from Jules Gounon. Mathieu Drudy goes through in third place. Timor Bogoslavski, fourth. Uh, tell you a lie, Charles Wirtz is up into fourth place. Timor Bogoslavski is in fifth and Aurelien Panis sixth as they go across the line. Now, it's a very slow run up towards Paddock as the marshals are hard at work. And Valentino Rossi got to where as he crossed the line? Well, he's up to 14th, so he's benefited from the chaos. Yes, I mean, whatever it takes to make up those positions, certainly that's the benefit of other people's misfortunes as we see the removal vehicle getting to work, getting those cars cleared from Paddock Bend. So, 
very slow in the run from the start finish line up to Paddicle Bend because I'm concerned about even at the pace of the safety car, I want to get those slowed down. Now that we're clear, the field is picking up there. We see on screen is Valentino Rossi making his way down from Druid into Graham Hill Bend. A corner actually that caused him considerable, let's say, frustration, I won't say difficulty, frustration on Saturday morning. He had a couple of very wide exits, but you know, he's smart, he's learning, and he's learning on the hoof, really. So it'll all come together. It's going to take another number of races, but. He's got high expectations of himself, and so has WRT ID team. Absolutely, and he's in at the deep end. You know, he's in the best team in the toughest championship. There's nowhere to hide. Uh, Jean Baptiste Simonau, Benji Goethe, Adrian Delina, they're all okay. They're out of their cars, we understand. Uh, we'll uh, piece it all together in a few moments. I think possibly Delina has got out of the gravel because I can see a Porsche heading along Cooper Strait. Uh, but there are the battered Audis, so it's those two that need retrieval. And uh, quite a lot of rear damage, rear suspension breakage. The Rothko car nearest to us of uh, Benji Goethe is the one that is certainly battered. Now, John, let's have a look at this. Well, we go racing. Forget about it. Oh, look down the inside. There's the Mercedes that caused yeah, it. it. It got tipped. Then he was off on the inside. And the two Audis and the Porsche end up going up. So the Mercedes went way up. It was off track. There it is now, mm. facing wrong way down the middle of Paddicle Bend. The Porsche was able to get regain track as its rear wheels and tyres were on the tarmac. But watch for the Mercedes. There it goes now. It has actually got two wheels off the racing line inside that demarcation. And once he makes the contact, it's a bit like a game of snooker. Just one car hits yeah. the other, but there's no, no pockets for them to go in. Start involving car 30, 33, 54 and 86 under investigation. The other element to that, John, of course, you saw well, Ilko, as you rightly said, two wheels on the grass. But... Of course, the barrier starts to taper out, so the room disappears. He had to get back on the racetrack. There, look, you see it taper, so he's got to force his way back on. Yeah, I mean, it was his error that set off this whole incident. I suspect that's going to be under investigation because he did have two wheels across that white demarcation line, and that line is there for a, a reason. Yep. It's not there to allow you to use it to your advantage. And, of course, as that line that narrows to nothing, he had to come back into the racetrack, and that's where the contact with the rear of the ID began, which then set off the next two cars. This is looking back from number 88, the uh, dual Gunon Mercedes. You can see it all just about at the top of the picture, but Gunon further up the road, he managed to escape all of that. Uh, just a quick word about Igor Welilko and that Mercedes we're talking about. Uh, part of the reasons he was where he was on the grid was he got a grid drop yesterday for setting his best time under yellow flags. If he'd been on the other side of the racetrack, it would be a different story, Maybe. but because you're up against the the pit wall, I mean, if you look down where I'm looking down from the commentary booth, the pit wall has got about four feet of grass, then you've got that pipe demarcation line. So he was across the demarcation line, two wheels on the grass, couldn't go any further to the right because he's got the pit wall there. And as I say, with the uh, barrier uh, tapering, he had to get back on the racetrack. Now, of course, Valentino Rossi was behind them. Uh, this is the view from Eddie Cheever's car. Now, this is Rossi. Look, there's the Mercedes on the right. Squeeze, tries to get back on, clips the Porsche, which clips the Audi, which clips the other Audi. And Rossi, oh, that was a real heart-in-mouth moment. Well, the first thing he would have done was lift his foot off the throttle as quick as possible and look for an escape route, because when you find yourself in a situation like that, you need to look for an escape route. Self-preservation is what Valentino Rossi was thinking at that moment. Well, that's Adrian Delina's Porsche out of the gravel, but into the garage. So the dynamic team goes to work to try and sort that car out for race two. If they can get it back into this race, it acts as a test session. And uh, Jérôme Policon, the uh, ASP bit of Aquidis ASP with the sunnies on, talks to Jim Pla. And, of course, now Jules Gounon stint, indeed stint for all of these drivers, less they can do because there are fewer racing laps before they make the pit stops. Yes, indeed. And... What would be an, an excellent start from Lucie de Paul. He gained the advantage initially. Jules Gunion was a half a car ahead, but he had to back out of it, at which point then the Ferrari went. So it sort of caught Gunion a little bit wrong footed, led into, into Padakil Bend, and really never had a threat or a challenge from Jules Gunion all the way up through up into Druids and then back down the other side, at which point we already had a safety car deployment uh, being indicated to the teams and drivers. Well, we've done now three laps, pretty much all bar a corner under the safety car. So the uh, race neutralised and they're in 14th place is Valentino Rossi. So the frustration for him is he can't go racing for the moment. Frustration for all of them. They have to sit here behind the safety car, which allows the race to continue, albeit under control conditions. Whilst the incident at Paddock Hill Bend is cleared, three cars tangled, effectively. Uh, one has got to go to the pits. 
So it's those two Audis that uh, need to be moved. When the lights go out on top of the safety car, that's the indication it will peel in at the end of that lap. And then we should be back in business. So onto the Grand Prix loop they turn. And the race order, Elise de Pals, Ferrari, Lee, Jules Goudnons, Mercedes, Matteo Drudy for Audi third, Charles Wirt, Audi fourth, Timo Bogoslavski having dropped a place, fifth, and Aurelien Panis sixth, ahead of Gilles Magnus, Simon Gachet, Peter Schoenholst, and then uh, Thomas Drouet, round at the top ten. And Elise de Pau as the overall leader, also leading in the silvers. Now, let's... Uh, Go back down to the pit lane and hear the thoughts of Frederick Verviche because he's watching his car in the hands of Valentino Rossi and he might also have a view on that first corner tangle. He's with Gemma. Fred, prior to the race, I asked Valley if he thought it might be daunting into Paddock Hill Bend and there we saw it must have been quite scary for him from his point of view from that accident. Yeah, 100%. Uh, it's quite unfortunate. We have two cars out of the our four cars of WRT and it could be even three. So, um, but I think for his first time taking a start, he did very well. He avoided the, yeah, the mess, let's say. Um, if we and have a look at the monitor here, we can yeah. see the accident unfolding. Um, and I believe we saw from on board with Valet exactly what he saw. Exactly. And yeah, he was just a passenger and he was just so lucky. Everything opened and the, the right one didn't come back on him. But yeah, I think he did very well. Uh, but for sure, he needs some luck as well. So maybe we are lucky today. So he, yeah, he did perfect to avoid everything. So I think it uh, was a nice wake-up call for him. And um, but yeah, he's okay. Just was asking uh, what happened exactly because he didn't know as well. It, it happened so fast. So but yeah, he did well. We are still in the race. So. That's the most important thing, Fred. Yeah. Thank you very much. All eyes are on you guys this weekend, right? <laughs> yeah, I see you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. For well, a good summary from Fred Vavish, but what really he didn't realise is that when Rossi had to lift off to avoid those cars going every which way in front of him, there was a car closing very rapidly on the rear of that 46 ID. Fortunately, there was no contact, but I bet you there wasn't more than a finger between the two cars. It was very close that he got tagged. Well... Good news, uh, good news is for that team, they are still in this uh, opening Fanatec GT race uh, for the Sprint Cup, and 14 for car is, and they can make progress from that. Uh, now, where are we up to in terms of the recovery? We've not seen Havoc for a moment, but I'm still looking at the lights I think, on, on the safety car, but you know, we've done four laps now, and we are 10 minutes into the race, so one is hopeful that we can't be too far off getting going once more. And again, in a sense, the pressure is back on Elise de Pau because he's got to do it all over again. Admittedly, this time he'll have Goon on behind, not alongside. Yeah, single file restart is going to be, oh, and that problem for, is that the 89 Mercedes? Why was that term of Timo Bogoslowski on that? Part of the racetrack coming out of Hawthorne, so he didn't catch the beginning of it, but he shouldn't have been over on the right-hand side. You know, the, the advantage is now clearly to the Ferrari because that will be the car that restarts the race once the safety car pulls in. Nobody can overtake until they come across start finish line, and all that plays to the favour of the cars that are further up the field. But in general, everybody's got to be obedient and wait until they cross start finish line. Now, I'm looking at the various MSV circuit vehicles returning to the uh, Grand Prix pits and paddocks. So maybe we're about to start the last lap for the safety car. The pace is quickening as well, which is always a good sign because the faster the safety car goes, the suggestion therefore is safety that you want the race... Safety car in this lap. Safety car in this lap. There you go. The race director, Alain Adon, confirms what I was thinking. This is the last lap. And the quicker the safety car goes, the better it is for the race cars because tyre temperatures can be increased. Tyre pressures come back up as well. We've got one Ferrari heading into the pit lane. And it uh, is Louis Machiels. Yes, and they're now on the sixth lap, of which no lap has yet been held or run under race conditions. So as the safety car begins to pull away from the field, it's still waiting to see the safety. There it is, though. The lights are still on. So once he gets midway round the lap, the lights will be turned off. The safety car will pull away. The control of the race will be in the controls of Lucy Stapau. And he will control the field all the way down till he gets either to the entrance of Clearways or the exit of Clark Curve before he gets on it. Now, that's Louis Machiels, who's just pitted, possibly left rear puncture, and has given up the Pro-Am lead, but he's back in the race and significantly stays on the lead lap. The team manager of Car 86, Igor Walilko, the Mercedes driver, he's got to go to the stewards immediately concerning the start incident. And it doesn't say on screen, cap in hand, either. No, it does not. So the team manager is on his way. We are on our way to go racing once more. So it was... 
you like, a, a really frustrating, almost phony start. One corner just to tempt you before we had to call for the safety car, but hopefully this time around we can go racing good and proper as Elise Pau slows the pace. Down they come, then heading towards clearways. Elise tries to jink left and right, just get a bit more temperature in the Pirellis, and Jules Gounon sits there menacingly behind. You can do all the weaving you want, says Jules. I'm not going anywhere, and he'll be on his toes. Here they come then, into Clark Curve, De Pau floors the throttle, the Ferrari accelerates away, and here they come up towards the line then to get the race back Lisa. underway. Ferrari leads Mercedes, leads Audi, one, two, three, over the line. We're back racing in Fanatec GT at Franz Hatch, up towards Paddock Hill, then they go, and it is De Pau ahead of Gounon by 0.488 of a second as they turn right, plunge downhill, and now up towards Druids. Yeah, well controlled restart by the Ferrari, and really nobody's been managing to either gain or lose positions on this restart. Downhill, then, for the first time, if you like, proper, uh, without any fear of yellow flags. So the pit window remains in exactly the same place. So these drivers have got fewer laps within their stint than they would have liked. So they've got to push, push, push. And one of them pushing is Rossi. He's there in 14th place, trying to catch onto the back of Ethan Simeone in the McLaren. And Timor Bogoslowski there goes through. In 89, Mercedes down in fifth place, just ahead of the blue Audi of Aurelien Panis. But De Pau, once more, beautifully controlled restart. Very good restart. Jules Gugnon has picked up the pace, but the car in third place, Matteo Drudi, that is probably of the three cars in the lead three positions, the one that I think is looking strongest on this restart. Yeah, that Audi is perhaps quicker in the hands of Matteo Drudi than Luca Giotto, who's still adapting to GT3 cars. Eddie Chiva goes through and looking stronger in 11th place now as you ride on board with the Sky Tempesta racing Mercedes up towards Sterling to go left, slightly banked corner, back onto the pound now, drag the car out the other side, and all of that grunt of the Mercedes takes it down towards clearways. And having to be a defensive indeed, they saw the Audi in his mirrors and likewise he said, again, well, is he going to lose position? The Audi has got the drive coming off side by side all the way down, start finish line, up into Panicle Bend, concedes one place, concedes two places. Because right there as well is Ethan Simeone, who goes through, goes wide. Somebody else has run really wide as well because there's gravel dust settling. They're all pushing on, but Elise De Pau leads from Gunon in second place. Third still is Trudy, and battles rage up and down the order. This is fourth, Bogoslavski fifth. Schieffer was able to retake that position from Simononi because the mistake that was made in Panicle Bend by the McLaren driver caused him to run wide, so Schieffer's claimed back at least one of the two positions he lost coming across to our finish line. Fastest lap, race leader, Elise De Pau, 1 minute 23.4, 21.7 he qualifying, we'll get there as the cars get lighter. But right now it is the Ferrari up front as the cars dive down towards Hawthorne to Elise De Pau leading Jules Gounon. And riding on board here with Valentino Rossi. Now he is shown as being in 15th place, but he was 14th at the start of the lap. So what's gone on here? That's what's happening. Ollie Wilkins says McLaren has got ahead of him. Well, that's one place last on the race track. So Valentino Rossi will now focus it. Can he, what can I do? Ollie Wilkinson takes a load on the curb on the inside going through Sheen. Now you can see Rossi back onto the rear of the McLaren. So there's a short run out of Sterling's all the way down into clearways. Wilkinson going defensive just to make sure there was no chance of going down the inside by the Audi. Now the first part of this Clark, or clearways Clark combination. But the McLaren beginning to stretch his legs as they come across start finish line. Work to do for Rossi. Absolutely. He's learning about the car still. He's learning about the circuit. Don't forget, he's never been here. He's never raced on a bike, in a car, a pram, anything. He's never been here. This is all new. So he's got a big, big learning curve to adapt to. And right now, Valentino Rossi is down in 15th place. But places can be bought back on the pit stops and through the efforts of Frederic Verbiche as the race leaders now work lap number nine. And we are edging our way towards that pit window between 25 and 35 minutes of the race. Now, Jules Gounon, absolute best in the first sector. Have a look at the speeds of these cars into Hawthorne's, the corner they're at now. Matteo Drudi in third place, comfortably, demonstrably the quickest at 237 kilometers an hour. All I can say is, Drudi is later on the brakes because <laughs> that gap, that eight kilometer gap, is no way down to the idea being that much quicker. He's just a little bit later on the brakes, but the gap between first and second is beginning to stretch. The Ferrari has, it was a 1.2 second gap when they came across start finish line at the end of lap eight. It's going to be further now when they come across at the end of lap nine. Yeah, Gounon gained a tenth in sector one and lost a tenth in sector two, but that Ferrari all of a sudden has just disappeared up the road. As the tyres get warmer, look, Elise de Pau was 1.2 seconds ahead of Jules Gounon last time. This lap, as they come across the line, de Pau sets another new fastest lap, and he's 1.9 seconds up the road. Well, that, that's pace. That's getting your tyres up to temperature, being able to 
then once you've got that security of extra grip, then you can just drive your race car. The last Ferrari win we had in Sprint Cup was Ten back in 2015. And that was at Masano, uh, the race director. 10 seconds stop and go penalty to car 86. Confirming causing a collision. 86, 10 seconds stop and go penalty for causing a collision. I think very lenient, but that's, it's a penalty. It's effectively taking the 86 Mercedes out of contention. And it's currently all the way down to 21st position anyway. 22nd is Louis Machil's Ferrari that had to come in for a tyre replacement. So 10 seconds stop go. That penalty incidentally is given by the stewards. You've heard it announced by the race director, but the judicial element of all of this is from the stewards. Greg Miles is the chairman of the stewards this weekend and uh, his team. So all the judicial activity goes on separately. The race director concentrates on this bit, running the race safely. And it is Ulisse de Pau at the end of lap 10, who is out on his own. The Ferrari looking dominant at the moment because he's just stroking it away. Well, he has found something with this Ferrari that even his very eminent teammate, Alexander Piol, has not been able to do. He's just got natural speed. And you can see the gap as you come across the line. Another three tenths of a second gain to the favour of the lead Ferrari. Up towards Drew, they go. Lap number 11. So that 10 second stop go penalty has got to be served. 10 seconds, of course, stationary in the pits, but you also lose the extra time driving in driving out at the uh, 50 kilometers an hour speed limit as you look at Jules Gounon, 2.2 seconds back. Now, yesterday, certainly in free practice, they weren't very happy about this car. When it braked, it started to pull a little bit to the left, so they were really uncomfortable with it. They seem to have got around that problem, but right now, just lacking pace relative to the Ferrari. I mean, the Ferrari's in a different world right now, and you can see Jules Gounon looking out on the screen. He's got the same image in his eyes that we've got on TV screen. There is nothing the, Ferrari, the Mercedes driver currently is able to do to keep even in contact with the lead Ferrari. And if anything, Jules Gounon needs to look to his laurels a little bit because behind him, Matteo Drudi is hustling along and he's taken a little bit out of that gap, only just under a tenth, but certainly second to third, that gap is coming down with five minutes or so off the pit window opening. And in the first two sectors, Drudi third, quicker than Gounon second, and that is Pierre-Alexandre Jean. He will take over the leading Ferrari. Yes, it will not be very long before pit window is open. So drivers preparing in case the team decide to bring the lead Ferrari in at the earliest opportunity. Right now, the pace that uh, Ulisse de Pau has got, one would assume they're going to keep him out. But of course, then when cars make their pit stops, you then get cars coming back out on track. And it's a matter of finding the right slot for you to get back into and not give up track position where possible. But right now, de Pau driving like a Ferrari veteran, isn't he? New to the car, but uh, you wouldn't think it. He's done the fastest lap of the race from pole position as Matthew Drudy hustles along in third place. The number 12 car collection run Audi. Uh, Charles Wirtz is fourth, but again, struggling to get onto the tail of the car collection Audi. He's keeping Boguslavski at bay. Aurelien Panis is in sixth place, just coming into shot in the blue. Santa Lock Audi in the background as we work lap 12 at Brands Hatch in this first sprint cup race in our 2022 Fanatec GT season. I mean, the pace of the Audi's third, fourth position, not very much to pick and choose between them, and therefore, Trudy's not making much, much further progress in running down Jules Gunion's second place. But this car, really, the gap has been more or less constant, and it runs wide, oh, oh, oh. had to get under the throttle big time. As he exited under sheet curve, you could see he actually going in. It was almost a point of losing the back of the car. Got it corrected enough to keep it more or less going straight, coming off sheet curve. Well, that brings Boguslavski back into the mix, doesn't it, as they turn now up towards the timing line. So Schalwitz makes a mistake. We saw a mistake at Imola as well, but he just pushes that a little bit too hard. And in fairness to him, Sheen Curve, that part of the circuit, was catching out people pretty much all the way through yesterday. A push her off up again at Sheen Curve, so what has gone on up there? I mean, this is part of the racetrack that has been resurfaced. Paddock Hill Bend, then down Graham Hill Bend, and further around the racetrack, Westfield. So, it seems for some reason, let's watch and see. Oh, there's the Porsche. Oh, and that, yes. Oh, well, all the guys who spend all the time putting up those track advertisers, that's going to be, it needs to be removed because cars will be running out to the very edge of that white line. Uh -huh. So that needs to be removed. How are you going to put a marshal out there and do it without putting out a full course yellow? I'm not quite sure. 
That was Giorgio Roda then spinning the Porsche. He rejoined, but it's not a good race for Dynamic Motorsport. One car spinning, the other one uh, off the road at the start. Didn't actually get tangled up with the Audis as such. It got into the back of others and had its own spin, but either way, it was in that first corner skirmish. Watch on the exit of Sheen to see what happens when the lead cars come through. What will they do? Has that bit of circuit advertising been removed or has it been literally they're still there? So there's a yellow ahead just to warn them of something on the road. Maybe the hope is that it'll get sort of blown away by the draft of the cars going past, but it's fairly heavy, it's not moving. No, it's not. I mean, they're usually made of polystyrene, but uh, it's lying there. Uh, drivers managing to come away from the edge of the racetrack before they get into that particular crucial area. So it is a gather of polystyrene of one form or another. Now, the race leader is nearly three seconds ahead now, at least to power building this gap over Jules Gounon. They're going through. Number one, five, nine. Thirteenth, Ethan Simeone, the Canadian Touring Car Champion, driving for Andrew Cucotti's Garage 59 squad as they head up towards Druids. Eddie Cheever has managed to keep the McLaren behind, having lost a position to him on the restart up into Paddock Hill Bend. So now that he's got everything working to his liking, he's now managed to keep the McLaren in uh, what is 13th position. Now this is for second look, and this gap is only seven tenths of a second. Trudy is inching up onto the back of that Mercedes. Whether he's gonna get there before the pit stops come, we'll have to wait and see. But certainly right now, the Audi is looking just that little bit quicker than the Mercedes. Yeah, it's a strange story because Jules Gunion normally, the pace that he has in these Mercedes, always, always at the very end of the limit of performance. But Matteo Trudy is sticking with him. The difficulty is he can catch him, but where is he going to find a way around the Mercedes? 2.4 miles, 3.9 kilometers, very difficult. There are nine principal corners here at Brands Hatch, and they all effectively flew one into another. Brilliant noise from that Mercedes as it growls its way over the line, but the margin now between the top two with 14 laps in the book is 3.2 seconds, and Depau is just set to build on this. Now let's have a look further back down the order and see where Valentino Rossi is. He is in 15th place, and actually he's fallen back by a few lengths from Ollie Wilkinson, so he's a little bit stuck at the moment. Yeah, so I mean, it's, look, he explained it's, a, it's a, a, a track unlike anything I've ever raced on, particularly on motorcycles, and it is old school. There's nothing outside of the edge of the racetrack but grass or barriers. You have to refocus and all that, learn to drive within those restrictions, limitations. So let's uh, have a look at this. Out of Graham Hill Bend, John, we're riding with Valentino Rossi. He does like to run wide coming out of Graham Hill Bend. Now up into Surtees, brings the Audi's nose in, makes his apex, gets that all bit right now. You can't say he's doing anything that's not correct. The only thing is he hasn't yet evolved enough time behind the wheel to develop his natural skills to get the pace that ultimately he is seeking. It's a tall thought where the road rises and turns right, short straight, Derek Minter straight up towards Westfield. A lift, a turn, back on the pot, on the throttle. Carl drops downhill, drags it up through Dingle Dell, up towards Sheen Curve, which has been the place that's caught out many. You ride the curb on the inside, and that can spit you out wide, can't it? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's been the, the bogey corner pretty much through the weekend. Runs wide on the edge of the Sterlings, but having seen other shots of him, he knows that car's already making their way into the pit lane, because the pit lane window is open. And the first one in is Drudy. So that's, and also Charles Wirtz and Timo Bogovsky uh, are in early within the window. So uh, number 12 of Matthew Drudy, 32 Charles Wirtz and 89 uh, Timo Bogovsky all in. And so is Valentino Rossi eager to let Fred Vervich take over and get on with the job. Yes, yeah, so I mean, the team, it is a team game. It's not just about an individual behind the wheel. So Fred Vervich already there opens the door and helps Valentino Rossi out of the car. Then that will be returned as the seat belts and shoulder straps in particular are assisted by Rossi. Get the lap strap done up first of all, then you've got the crutch strap, then the shoulder straps. It's a bit of a struggle sometimes if the belts are not cleanly released when the evacuating driver gets out. So a little bit of a struggle there still is that the, the, the remains as the lead Ferrari comes through 3.4 seconds advantage. And he is going to stay out until this pit stop window is about to close. What Jules Gunion's doing is there, Val uh, Fred Ravish returns to the track, so stays on the lead lap, which is going to be key for this car's ultimate uh, result. Well, staying out, look, the white Ferrari of Elise de Pau and also Jules Gunion behind. 
So even though that gap continues to widen between them, 3.4 seconds last time, and as Gunnar just breaks the beam now, we are looking at 3.3 seconds. Uh, both cars stay out on track. What's going to be interesting now is to see, uh, as a little bit wider, Druid goes to power, exactly where uh, Dries Van Voor and Luca Giotto in those Audis from third and fourth slot back in after the stops. Well, those very early stoppers will maybe gain the, the, certainly the, the track advantage. Whoa. Oh, off a Porsche again. Can't get back on the racetrack because of the traffic. Couldn't cut back on because of the furniture lying on the ground. So number 56 having a, a, a second drama of the race. And once more, it's Giorgio Roda. Yeah, he seems to like that part of the off-track track up at the sheet curve. It's not something he's doing intentionally. Just getting caught by... Whatever, we'll maybe find out later why he was off there so many times. Right, so the cars come over the timing line and on the pit stops, uh, Luca Giotto, number 12, has fallen back behind Dries Van Voor, so the third and fourth placed Audis have switched over. Not surprised, WRT Audi, the masters of the driver change, pit stop, four wheels, tyres. So that will give Dries Van Voor a little bit of a chance to now have a, a pop at what will be one assumes when the 88 and uh, 53 cars of the Mercedes Ferrari. So ladies are in, the Ferrari certainly clearly in, whereas the Mercedes don't see it in the pit lane as yet. So Gugno stayed out, he stayed yeah. out. So it's a Ferrari lead Ferrari. I wonder why they would have brought this car in so early because Ulisse de Power was doing such a great job, in my view, keep him out as long as possible. But the team have to make these calls, they've re rehearsed, discussed, decided what they're going to do. Just going back to my Audis for a moment, the Dries Van Voor entry, number 32, moving ahead of number 12, now Luca Giotto. 41.4 seconds in the pits for number 32 from WRT. Hold that thought, 41.4. The number 12 Audi, 44.9. So again, WRT on the pit stops, boom, gain a place. You can't make up that time in the racetrack. That's why the pit stop, the driver change, is such a fundamental and, and, and important part particularly in a one-hour sprint race. There's 89 Mercedes. This is now Raffaele Marchiello, and he's getting himself onto the back of Luca Giotto, who's nowhere near as experienced a GT racer. And Marchiello should, I would have thought, make short work of him here. Look at the pressure that's being applied. Dived on the inside, but it's all cut off by Giotto. He's got lots and lots of great single-seater experience. So now the next opportunity is up the inside into Surtees again. Giotto covers that. So now frustration already on the opening lap for Raffaele Marcello to find a way around the number 12 Audi, but right again under the rear wing. Defence on the right-hand side now. Well, the Mercedes has got the benefit of being a little bit later in the brakes into Hawthorne. He's got oh. the pass, good pass. Giotto had to concede. He was too tight coming into Hawthorne and had to get out of the throttle. Lovely move by Raffaele Marcello. So that brings him through the order. Gains a place and look, having passed on the outside line, look at the gap he's pulled in that corner and a bit. Oh, somebody has hit them. <laughs> now we've got Paul Star in all over the racetrack and the exit coming out of Sheen Curve. So whether that will again be a matter to be attended to or not, but look, Raffaele Marcello in the space of four corners has pulled probably the best part of a second as Dries Van Thor in the number 32 ID, and there he can see the lead Ferrari now in the hands of Pierre-Alexandre Jean. Oh, so wide, wide, Dries Van Thor. Why are you so wide in panic? He saved it, a little mistake. And there, smashing through the polystyrene was 87, the Casper Stevenson Mercedes. So that's why it's now in fragments. I think it was really trying to get round the Porsche. Yeah, yeah. It's limping its way back towards the pit lane. Now, Jules Gounon comes down towards Clark Curve. Is he in this time? No, he is not. He stays out. Gounon is a little bit quicker than Jim Pla, so it makes sense to keep him out for as long as possible. His laps at the moment are 23 fours, and his best was a... No, in fact, that is Gounon's best lap now, just done, a 23-2. So now with a completely different feel about the race, suddenly Jules Gounon's putting in his best lap times as he has to almost treat this like qualifying uh, before, at the end of this lap, I suspect, he bails for the pit lane. Well, in fact, his best lap ought to be the lap he comes into the pit lane because it is absolutely crucial that when you decide to come in that you are on it 100% until you get to the entrance into clearways, and then you have to peel off into the pit lane and, of course, get down to the, the speed limit in the pit lane, 80 kilometers per hour.
So at the moment, we have Pierre Alexandre Jean ahead of Dries Van Thor, ahead of then Raffaele Marchiello, ahead of Luca Giotto and Patrick Niederhauser. But they've all stopped, and 88 Mercedes has not. We need to see where that car feeds in against them. The fastest lap of the race remains number 53. But now, Raffaele Marchiello goes even quicker. There he is, and Lello does a 122.557. He's got himself up past Giotto, as we saw, and Marchiello is on a mission. Cunha is going to come in this lap, and I said 80 kilometers an hour. I hope he doesn't, because he'll be in big, big trouble. It's 50 kilometers per hour in the pit lane, and that's being rigorously enforced all weekend. Yeah, it's 49.9, not 50.1, effectively, isn't it? Right, in comes, as Adam Carroll dubbed him at Alton Park, chicken nugget. Uh, so Jules Gounon comes in, and uh, down the pit road comes 88. Now, he did have, of course, the Sky Tempesta Mercedes ahead on that lap, so he might have just dropped a little bit of time, but the key to all of this is the pit stop time. The pit stop time from the Ferrari was 46.6 seconds. They've got to beat that to try to get the lead. That's going to be a big ask. I mean, we know that, that the uh, Coders ASP team are pretty sharp in the pit lane. There is the Ferrari that effectively is our leader coming through Sheen Curve, so the wheels, tyres being changed. Jules Gugnot standing back, oh. watching. Get off the pit lane, Jules. But that wheel didn't go on. No, they lost didn't. time there, and you can see the frustration from Jules Gugnot. The car's away now, but that will have cost them time. So we'll see when it breaks the beam at pit out. The Ferrari goes through, back into the lead. But the Mercedes is going to drop down the order, let's see, because across the line, now there's Van Thor, and it's cost the Mercedes crew a place. The car rejoins, but that was 46 and a half seconds. But well, watch Marcello, he has just set the fastest race lap. Looking to get alongside up the in. Jim Pla is on the defence on the inside. Marcello tries to go the long way around. He's got to be careful. He's now half on the racetrack, half off it, but he has a fine space down the inside into Graham Hill Bend. He can pick up his momentum, he momentarily lost it, and he was, well, how do I find a way past Jim Blau in my sister car? He made it, he forced it, and that's part of what Raffaele Marcello is all about. So second, all the way through the first stint, and fourth, with half a lap of the next stint done, and Jules Gounon is going to be very frustrated, you can tell that, you don't need me to tell you it, because some of the time was lost with that left rear wheel that just wouldn't seat, they had to try again and again and again, and that's cost them a big chunk of time. It certainly did, but what was clear on that last lap Marcello has set fastest race lap by 122.5 so he was up to speed up to speed and the momentum he was carrying now 88 down in fourth place have a look at this go to the left rear wheel goes on won't won't Oops. won't try again try again try again look at that So a big chunk of time lost in that. Yeah, I mean, he couldn't get the wheel, wheel to seat in the dowels, and he had to pull it back off, back on again. Off. I mean, it seems like six minutes. In reality, it's only six seconds. But the really bad news is that with that, you've lost two places. So now we have Pierre-Alexandre Jean uh, leading by three seconds from number 32 Audi of Dries Van Ford that was nowhere in the first stint. So that's the race leader, twas ever thus. But have a look behind, because the number 32 Audi that he's on a mission is in the hands of Dries Van Ford the reigning champion, his last lap was a 22.855. Actually, not quite as quick as Pierre-Alexandre Jean's last lap, but he's got to make up 3.1 seconds. So this is your battle for the race lead. Yes, and also this battle, second place, third place, you've got the Mercedes of Marcello. You want to be lasering into the back of the idea as Van Thor is looking forward to see where the Ferrari is. He wants to see that gap closing here at Brands Hatch because corners are close to one another. If you are gaining, you see it relatively quickly. And Marcello way wide again, coming out of Westfield Bend on the ragged edge. Takes the inside, going through sheet curve, keeps the car beautifully balanced. Jimmy Plough likewise in the his sister car. And look at Marcello, he's a, a just to watch the guy drive a race car. The gap is, I in my view, is going to be down, but it was 2.1 seconds, second to third. It's going to be now probably on the two seconds, fractionally less possibly. I mean, yesterday, uh, Raffaele Marchiello had a big moment at Paddock and did a fraction of damage to the car, but it could have been a whole lot worse. So, on the edge was he. The lead gap is 3.192 seconds. It's come down by 3,000, that's all. So, actually, Pierre-Alexandre Jean is responding to the challenge, isn't he? I would say he's driving the race better than he might have done in his qualifying stint yeah. for race two. So, he's behind the pace, he's happy with the car. He is not being challenged. He can maintain 
the pace and any traffic that he's coming up against so far has not been an, uh, a difficulty for him to find a way around. That Ferrari you're looking at is the Pro-Am leading car. Cedric Brazioli has taken over from Hugo Delacour and uh, leads the class, or he did. I think Patrick Koprinski has got ahead of him now, hasn't he? Just looking up the road. No, Koprinski is still second and Andrea Bertolini is third. Yes, so there's the McLaren second. Third is Andrea Bertolini in the delayed Louis Machiel's entry. So further up the road is Sprezzuoli well clear. And fourth behind them is the Garage 59 McLaren. There it is, look, Dean McDonald closing all the while. Dean McDonald was very impressive all day Saturday. So one would assume that the McLaren is going to run down the Ferrari. And I would imagine the pace that he showed, certainly, when he was running on Saturday, he will be able to get around the Ferrari relatively easy. Well, Dean McDonald returns to GT3 after a season of GT4. But look at Andrea Bertolini here going after Patrick Kroprinski. Kroprinski has taken over from former Grand Prix racer Christian Klein. But Kroprinski right now under real pressure from the decorated Andrea Bertolini, who's got a very, very good CV of winning GT titles. Now, race leaders go through the gap 3.1 seconds between Pierre-Alexandre Jean and Dries Van Thorpe. Their number 11 is Christopher Hauser, who's on the back of Casper Stevenson. Stevenson, who's taken over from Thomas Drouet, is in seventh place, having a really impressive drive. First season of GT3 cars. But he's got an old hand behind him, Christopher <laughs> Hauser, in the ID. Again, over the weekend, of Sean great natural pace we come to expect it from Christopher Hauser. Usual story here at Brands Hatch, you can catch, but where will you find a way around a car of a, of a comparable pace to that of yours? So Christopher Hauser then, Hauser being the German for hair, as in the animal, and he's pairing off in pursuit right now in eighth place of Casper Stevenson as the gap between the pair of them is 0.478 of a second. Our Sheen curve update, is that the Sky Tempesta? Mercedes rally crossing, it is, and that was Chris Froggart at the wheel of the car, so he's lost track position to perhaps early. This is how he did it. Well, in fairness, it's the owner of the car, the owner of the team, so he can do these things, can't he? <laughs> Trouble is, he gave away a place, he avoided the gravel, and there goes perhaps early around the outside of him. Number 11, Christopher Hauser then still pushing on way up the kerb coming out of Sterling's that gravel bed uh, moved back which was a good thing yesterday because in it went Valentino Rossi he did we never saw how he actually got to win it we just saw him ending up in it and again the frustration from the Italian at the, real, uh, the reality of uh, ending up in a gravel trap and uh, anyway anyway watching Christopher Hassa. oh and the Mercedes Stevenson runs wide a, a gift an absolute gift for Christopher Hassa. Indeed so, and he takes full advantage of that, so he applies the pressure to the British young gun who's made this uh, conversion from single-seaters to GT cars. He was uh, impressive in the Gulf 12 hours at the start of the year, uh, with uh, not the hugest of entries, admittedly, but his lap times were good, but there, with an old hand, as you've been saying, Christopher Hauser applying the pressure, little mistake made by Casper Stevenson, and that drops him into eighth place, but they're still second in silver. Just looking at the top of the scoring is gap between first and second is down to 2.8 seconds second to third is 1.6 seconds 20 minutes to go this is still a live motor race Fred Ravish behind the wheel of the 63 40, 40, 40, 46 64 63 no, 46 in 13th place chasing down Rob Bell in the McLaren can't give the wrong number to Rossi's car you'll never get out alive John absolutely uh, he's hunting down Rob Bell in the McLaren it was Rob's birthday yesterday so this is now 12th and 13th places and the McLaren is being caught as you can see by Fred Babich their last three laps quicker over the last two have been the Audi so he's almost on the back of the Brit but again catching him and uh, finding a way around will never ever be an easy story but Fred Babich is one of God's natural racers he's a racer yeah. not just a racing driver to the timing line they come and there is the race leader. Now there is traffic ahead, and Dries Van Thor is only a second and a half behind him. That traffic is uh, not getting out of the way, and Pierre Alexander Jean can't find a way through. And he looks at the data, looks at the gap, and says, Where's all the time gone? It was 2.8, now it's a second and a half. Well, traffic is always an issue. Finding a way around it is uh, a bigger issue. He's gotten ahead of the Ferrari, so now that will be the issue for Dries Van Thor, who's going to wait, wait, wait. He can't do anything coming into Westfield. He's not going to get a chance to do anything, really. Probably until at the earliest he gets onto the exit of Stirlings, and there it's a, so, a short run down to Clearways. So he's got to be thinking way ahead. Where can I find a way around the Lamborghini? Most likely it's going to be up into Paddock Hill Bend, unless, unless there is cooperation from the Lamborghini. 
Well, Dries Van Thor, more experienced, a GT racer, of course, dives up the inside, through he goes, gets ahead of Gerhard Verhaalse, and up towards the timing line now comes PAJ, Pierre-Alexandre Jean. Now, having cleared the traffic, is he going to be able to respond? Let us see. The margin was only a second and a half, and with 18 minutes to go, you were right, it is a live motor race, most definitely. It's still a second and a half. In that last sector, though, Pierre-Alexandre Jean was able to pick up his pace again. Yeah, lap tra traffic. Lap 25 certainly took a chunk of time. 34, just a quarter of a second, but the key is settled down. Pierre-Alexandre Jean has now got clear of the traffic. Dries van Thor still one and a half seconds behind. The problem now is Raffaele Marcello finding a way around the Lamborghini, having to go the long way, coming up into Sterling's, has made the pass. You can see again just the gaps between second and third place, how much time Van or Marcello has been taking out of the second place, Audi. Jim Pla fourth, you're riding with him a moment ago. Fifth is Patrick Niederhauser, Audi, and sixth now Luca Giotto's Audi having fallen back uh, after the pit window. There is Pla in that fourth spot now. Raffaele Marcello is lapping quicker than the two ahead of him, but of course the traffic that they've had to contend with will be heading his way as well. There is Pla in fourth spot, and we've got 17 minutes of change still on the clock. Down towards Sterling's goes Pla. Accelerates now down towards the approach to Clark curve as Eve Witz with Sun Charles next to him looks on. They, of course, focusing on number 32 Audi. It is in second place, and in the first sector, time was lost. In the second sector, time was lost, interestingly. Yeah, and the gap second to third, and the last lap was seven tenths of a second. Waiting to see what it is now. So what is up to eight tenths or a fraction of a second. Again, really due to that overtaking on the previous lap getting your way around and we did see the 89 Mercedes getting delayed momentarily but now Raffaele Marcello's looking again into the WRT garage and Valentino Rossi keeping an eye on the situation 13th place right now for the 46 ID. Well now I think the best news that's going to come the way of PAJ, Pierre Alexandre Jean, is that Marchiello is almost up with Vantor, and if they start squabbling, it'll delay the pair and just let that Ferrari build the gap. It's built three tenths of a gap extra on that last lap, so it was very much the traffic getting in the way. Once the car is clear a bit, so Pierre Alexandre Jean picks up his pace. UDP, Ulysse de Pau did the first in, PAJ does the second, it'll be the other way around in race two, but this is the battle to look for now for second and third places. Vantor being caught by Marchiello. Daunting sight any time that number 89 Mercedes with Raffaele Marcello behind the wheel. When that is in your mirrors, you've got to be on your toes. And he was on the exit of Sterling. You can see the ID kicking up dust as it rode the curve. Now coming into clearways. Gap does seesaw as you break and then accelerate. So back onto this long, what you might call straight, but it's a very, very shallow curve all the way up to Paddock Hill Bend. And look at the speeds that are achieved. Raffaele Marcello can do 182 miles an hour, not through the corner, but approaching it. 178 from Christian Kleens, McLaren, Cedric Sparazzi early, 177. Patrick Niederhauser brave, so is Dean McDonald on 176 kilometers an hour. Out of Druids now, plunge downhill. We are on lap 29. We have got 15 minutes still to go, and the lead gap is up to 2.2 seconds as Van Thor's out wide. Very wide on the exit of Graham Hill Band. That, again, is going to shave a tenth or so off the gap between second and third place. And in fact, that's the kind of pressure that Marcello is wanting to apply at every corner around the Brands Hatch circuit because that's the way he knows he'll get inside the head of uh, Dries Van Thor. Now, the run to Hawthorns, Dries Van Thor is the fastest there from Luca Giotto. Not through the corner, it's up uh, to it's it's only uh, one kilometre a mile slower. And that's the speed coming up to Hawthorns as there through Sheen Curve comes the battle for second place. Now in the first sector of this lap, Van Thor did a personal best, just extended the margin ever so slightly over March Yellow. Yeah, kicking up the dust on the exit of Sheen. Again, it's sort of seesaw between what it was half a second, just under half a second. So what it will be at the end of this lap looks as if it's probably marginally, maybe slightly, well, more favourable to George Dries Van Thor, but the timing and scoring will tell us what it is. It was 0.47 before, it's 0.822. So Van Thor has clawed back a few hundreds of a second in that last lap. Around Druids goes Van Thor, lead gap 1.8 then. So he's still on this battle for first, second and third. And as they drop downhill once more, Jim Plar is still in fourth place, 3.6 seconds clear of Patrick Niederhauser. Luca Giotto is sixth, Christopher Haas is seventh, Casper Stevenson eighth, Dennis Marshall's Audi ahead of his teammate Arkin Acker ninth and tenth. And Vervici still 13th, stuck behind Rob Bell in the McLaren as there. 
Pierre Alexander Jean goes through. Now, he only has to win by a thousandth of a second. So he's got a gap. He needs to hang on to that gap and he needs to hang on to that place. But actually, much yellow has fallen away, it seems, from Banthal. He's not been able to maintain that pace to stay on the back of him. Well, you've got the pace in the process of catching. It's the same situation when you do get into the zone, the aerodynamic zone, as we see the top speed up into Sheen, 163 kilometers per hour. And it is Jim Pla and the 88 Mercedes, then the 1832 Audi. Fred Babiche, come on, Fred. <laughs> A nation expects here, Fred. So 88 turns through fourth, Jim Pla comes out of Sterling's. But big, big frustration because the car did not seem to have the absolute pace in that first stint, doesn't have it now, plus the time lost in the pits. And we know that Jules Gounon was very, very unhappy about that pit stop. Yeah, and, and basically third place, there it is, you can barely see it climbing the top of Paddockle and dropping down. So race leader now, Ferrari. Then the RD with a gap, 1.6 seconds, then back to third base, 0.7 of a second. Second and third are going to maybe draw a bit closer, but I think the Ferrari just seems to be able to, other than when it gets into traffic, have enough in hand to keep itself out of the claws of Dries van Thor. Well, there's Andrea Bertolini, third in Pro-Am, and he is chasing after the Christian Clean Patrick Krupinski McLaren. I think I said it was started by Christian Klein. It's got a transponder glitch. It was Krupinski that started it. It is now Christian Klein driving the McLaren, and Andrea Bertolini is chasing after it. Cedric Sparazzioli leads the class in Ferrari number 21. There he is, way, way up the road now. And fourth in the Pro Am contest at the other end. Dean McDonald still trying to catch uh, Bertolini as the race leaders are on lap number 31. There is 159, which is now. Manuel Maldonado turning his way out of Druids and the drop down towards Graham Hill Bend. Now, Dries Van Thor has done a personal best in the first sector, but not as quick as Pierre Alexandre Jean. No, but he is in the second sector. On the last lap, he was a tenth of a second quicker than the Ferrari. So it's all ebb and flowing here. Is another battle that's getting very tasty indeed. You've got Luca Giotto in the number 12, Audi number 11 behind Christopher Hasser. That gap has been running about half a second and probably now coming through clearways. It's got to be as close as you can get, three, four tenths of a second. To the timing line they come then. So this little fight that you're looking at as they come through between the Audis is now for sixth. Luca Giotto uh, being reeled in by his much more experienced teammate Christopher Hauser. Ignore the car behind because Gerhard Sverhauser in that Lamborghini is a lap down. So it's the two car collection Audis going toe to toe, sixth and seventh. You've got to put your money on Hauser, really, given his experience. You have in terms of experience, but you know, a driver like Luca Giotto, who's come out of very competitive, very combative single seater racing, will be glued one eye on the mirror, one eye on the racetrack. And we know that he's prepared to use the racetrack to defend, and that will frustrate Christopher Hauser, who has got maybe natural speed, but can't find ultimately the pace to get away around the uh, the number 12 Audi of Luca Giotto. So down they turn through Hawthorns. Still 10 more minutes of the race to go. The lead gap is down again, by the way, 1.6 seconds, because as much yellow falls away from Vantor, that means that Dries doesn't have to think about defending and can push, push, push. And there is the leading Ferrari, 10 minutes to go. So what are we looking at? Six laps? on borrowed time. That is a nervous Ulysse de Pau who's done everything he can and this is the age-old problem in double driver endurance racing. All you can do now is sit and wait. Yes, and you can look at the monitor and see are there any other problems ahead of us? In other words, will there be other cars that are about to be overtaken for a lap, a go a lap down? That will be the concern for Ulysse de Pau right now. So a lot of this is down to the pace of March Yellow. If he can stay on the tail of the Audi, and he is having another push, uh, then that might just affect the ability for Banthor to go after the race leader. Hauser is through, by the way, to sixth place. He's got ahead of his teammate now. But there is Pierre-Alexandre Jean, and the margin is 1.7 seconds as we're into nine and a half minutes of the race still to go. So Marcello has run down Chris Van Thor in this last lap. Uh, up into Hawthorne Bend. That's the speed on the exit of the corner, then up to just under 200 kilometers an hour into Westfield, then the drop down in the compression. The race leader is on his last warning for track limits at Graham Hill Bend. So Pierre Alexandre Jean has had enough warnings, penalties come from here on in. So whatever he's doing, he's now going to focus on staying on the racetrack as Van Thorpe kicks up the dirt at Sterling's. I hope somebody in the AF Corsa team is putting that message across to Pierre Alexandre Jean because to throw away what would be a very nice victory because of just running a little bit too wide 
consistently on the exit of Graham Hill Band would be massive, massive disappointment. So there is the race leader, Pierre Alexander Jean heads up the hill, goes towards Druids. The margin, he's got his 1.8 seconds, turns through the corner at Druids for Happen now, drops downhill. This is the corner. Talk us through it. Right, into the corner, get the nose in, take the curb at the inside. Now watch the exit. Is okay. He had two wheels on the white line. So that time, no issue. But if he gets all four wheels over that demarcation line, then that's going to get the attention of the stewards and then the race director. And I would say the Vanfall was much, much wider that time around than uh, Pierre Alexander Jean was. He was right out onto the green bit as he does his level best to keep Marcello at bay. Eight minutes of the race to go. So there is Pierre Alexander Jean through. And let's have a look. This is what he has been doing. Right up over there. But look yeah, at but Vanfall, look at he's even wider. Well, and Marcello, all three lead cars are guilty, my lad of the yep. same penalty, so are they getting notifications likewise? To the teams, I suspect they are, but it's the fact that it's the last warning to Pierre-Alexandre Jean that is why it's up on the timing screen. They'll be communicated to the teams independently as here he comes then, seven and a half minutes to go down towards Clark Curve. Now, what can Marciello do here in order to get onto terms again with the Audi? This second to third gap really is elasticated, and Marciello is going to have to dig deep in his book of tricks in order to dislodge that Audi from second spot. Nothing left from the tank, as far as I can see. He's pushed extremely hard on the opening laps of a stint. There you can see the gap. So it's gone to the favour of the lead Ferrari over lap 33 and lap 32. Clawed back a little bit lap 34. But, I mean, going back to Marcello, he's stuck again of all three lead cars let's say using a little bit more still more a little bit doesn't count it's more that counts Van Thorbo pushes the car through Surtees there and look that gap to the eye is less so now the Mercedes is having another go I said it was elasticated yes but he catches gets into the the, the, the disturbed air from the, the wash from the rear of the Audi and then that usually it sets up a little bit of lack of grip on the front of the Mercedes, so he, he has to back out of it, or he can't keep the throttle open as early as he needs. Up towards Sheen Curve they come, Van Thor will be very conscious of where that Mercedes is, he'll be conscious of the Ferrari, and the gap was only 1.4 seconds at the start of the lap, but it's concertina at Sterling's here. Yeah, I mean, again, running the curve at the exit, so all that, of course, the, the, the dust coming off the back of the Audi gets onto the tyres of the Mercedes, another contribution to the difficulty that Marcello was having. To the timing line they come, the clock ticks on down, we're into the last six minutes of the race. They were down the order there, Andrea Bertolini goes through, number 52, he's still on the tail of Christian Kleen, still can't find a way past the Dean McDonald is right with him, this is for second, third and fourth within Pro-Am. It's been like this for lap after lap, but you get the feeling now something might give. It's five minutes, or five and a half minutes remaining, so Dean McDonald sees what he needs to do is a question of whether he can use the two cars directly ahead of him, one holding up the other, to sneak the advantage. But again, we know Brands Hatch, it's just racing is wonderful, but overtaking is very difficult. Just up the road is Chris Frog at 16th in the Sky Tempesta Ferrari, 17th, 18th, 19th for cars squabbling for second place in Pro Am. The leading silver is the outright leader, Pierre Alexander Jean. The leading Pro Cup car, Dries Van Thor and Charles Witt, Audi in second place. But it looks like it's going to be a maiden Sprint Cup win at Brands Hatch, at least for Ferrari. And Ferrari's first Sprint Cup win since we were at Masano in 2015, when Norbert Seidler and Marco Seyfried were victorious in what was then called the qualifying race. And that, of course, was a 4-3-4-8 Ferrari. We're now in the 4-4-8, the turbocharged version. And next year, we're going to have a 296. Totally new car, new engine configuration, and it'll be a flyer. Absolutely so. Right, the leaders go by then with four and a half on the clock, and the gap for the lead is down to 1.3 seconds. Little by little by little, Dries Van Thor is catching up onto the back of the Ferrari. Marcello rode the kerb on the inside of Pedicle Bend. That threw the car a little bit out to the left. And I mean, the gap is, you can barely see the differences, but it's that kind of little misjudgment that frustrates you know what you're trying to do and you just take too much kerb, you get too greedy, and that throws the car off the, the best part of the race. Like, look at the rubber going down at Surtees for the first time all weekend on that brand new bit of resurfaced racetrack. 
you can now see the benefit of what that new surface is giving the teams. The car ahead is number 86 Mercedes of Petru and Bereshku, the Romanian driver, and the team that operates that Ferrari, AF Corsa, asking race control, can we have a blue flag for that Mercedes, please, to let the driver know that the car behind is about to lap him and get out of the way, and release the Pals. Heart rate starts to go up and up and up. Nervous moments for the Ferrari team, AF Corsa, need the Mercedes to step aside they can go down to the team and say, please, please, would you make sure that your driver acknowledges blue flags or at least uses his mirror? Into the clearways, into Clark Curve. Three more minutes are on the clock. For Ferrari, which had the advantage over Mercedes in stint one, now has it over Audi in the second stint. And as they go over the timing line, a gap of 1.3 seconds last time is still 1.3 seconds. But it could all change depending on what that Mercedes does. Druid's turns, Pierre Alexander Jean, who made a real name for himself in Alpine's in GT4 racing, but has adapted to this Ferrari just like Elise de Pau has incredibly well this weekend. And Dries van Thor, quicker over the last couple of laps, has chipped away at that gap. But even if he gets onto the back of that Ferrari, it won't be easy to overtake. And again, look, much yellow hustles on behind him, closes up a little bit. And a blue waved yellow flag for the 86 Mercedes. But he's saying, well, you know, if he's quicker than me, let him pass me. I'm not doing it, I'm just driving my own race. Well, Charles Witts would dearly like for something to give his car an advantage. Elise de Pau can barely watch all of this because he did a mega job in his stint. And for two more minutes and a bit, he's got to hope and pray. Of course, the other thing about that Mercedes, they've not quite caught the car yet. And it rather depends where you do catch it. And it may be a part of what De uh, Pierre Alexandre Jean is doing is trying to judge how quickly I need to catch to the car ahead of me, but also keep the second and third place cars behind me. They're going to come on soon. Will they get one more lap and they come across the start finish line? I think this is going to go on to the penultimate lap rather than being on it. So this will yeah. be one more lap, then the final lap. Yeah, there's some one more as Pierre Alexandre Jean leads by one second. The gap less than ever and two laps to go. They make the climb up towards Druids. The flags are being waved, but until Umarescu is absolutely caught by the Ferrari, he's not going to move. He's not going to suddenly back out of it and crawl around. So Pierre Alexander Jean has got to try and get through at exactly the optimum moment around the circuit. And I mean, the Mercedes has got all the same straight line performance that the third place Mercedes of Marcello has got. So he's saying, well, if you're quicker than me, find your own way around. But he's being given the warning flags. I don't know how many more of them he needs. You can see now headlights flashing on the Ferrari trying to get the attention to make sure but you know he feels I've got pace yep. you, if you're quicker than me then make your way around and you can see second and third closing 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 because in the first sector two tenths taken out by Dries Van Fort so sweaty palms time this for Pierre Alexandre Jean because he can see second and third getting that little bit closer but really he's going to drive his own race the more he focuses on what's going on behind the more he might make mistakes now this would be the ideal opportunity it's and yes Malilko does get out of the way sorry Umberescu does get out of the way blue lights on and to the inside goes the Ferrari but Vantor pounces as well and so does Marcello to set us up nicely for the last lap of our opening Fanatec GT Sprint Cup race of the year one might say that the Ferrari was the fractional loser in all that sort of lap and a half two laps behind the 86 Mercedes but now he's got clear he's got clear air will be able to use all the strengths the Ferrari has had throughout this weekend ought to be safe but you know one lap to go halfway round, well a third of the way even a quarter of the way round. <laughs> it's not over until it's over down to Graham Hill Bend they come second and third that gap reduced it's closer second to third than it is first and second and if Marcello again can hustle on behind Van Thor, who's got to defend, that gives Pierre Alexander a, a free ride. And PAJ does come out further ahead. Look at this, second and third. Marcello is having one last roll of the dice. Well, he's got an opportunity because he's getting into that zone, but he's not clear enough, close enough, even coming up under Hawthorne's, the speed the Mercedes has had, and the speed through Hawthorne's still. And now running out of both time and lap is now over halfway around this 2.4 mile circuit and you've got three corners to go and none of those are going to be easy opportunities as long as pierre alexander jean doesn't make a mistake at sterling's nor clark curve he's good for the win van thor is good for second much yellow fastest lap of the race good for third 
What a dramatic start to our Sprint Cup season in Fanatec GT. The chequered flag is at the ready, and it is going to be a win for AF Corsa, for Elise de Pau, and for Pierre Alexander Jean, who brings home the Ferrari to win race one of the Sprint Cup at Brands Hatch. Dries Van Thor is second, Raffaele Marcello is third, and a brilliant job done by the Ferrari team. This for fourth is Jim Pla delayed in the pits, but fourth is the reward, and Elise de Pau can finally breathe. Great result for AF Corsa. Great result for the two drivers, Elise de Pau and Pierre Alexander Jean. A faultless race, great pit stop, only the concerns of those closing laps. And Vavish has got himself looked right onto the back of Rob Bell. I don't think he's quite going to be able to get close enough to make a move at the very end, but not for the ones of trying as they come across the line. So Rob Bell 12th and Fred Vavish with Valentino Rossi 13th. Uh, Cedric Sprazioli is about to come through to win in Pro-Am, but second, third, fourth, they're still in the same order. They're stuck behind 93 for uh, the uh, 93 Mercedes, I should say, at Sky Tempest Racing. Chris Frog fending them all off. And so Christian Klein keeps Bertolini and also Dean McDonald at bay down through Clark Curve. They will come in a moment, the flag awaits. And so, although Sprazioli has been through to win in Pro-Am, for second, it's going to be clean and Krupinski, and they might just get a place overall because the McLaren is absolutely level with the Mercedes and does go through on the line. And the margin between clean and Froggett was 14 thousandths of a second. Wow. What you get at Brands Hatch? That's what you get. Well, what about that from AF Corsa? Pierre Alexander Jean and Ulysse de Pau, the race one winners. Fantastic effort, and we've had a Silver Cup win in the past uh, outright. We had one at Zandvoort last year. The first one came here back in 2019, and we've had another one where the Silver Cup drivers, who are the match of the pros, come through for victory. And it's been a rare outright win in sprint for Ferrari, but Ulysse de Pau absolutely overjoyed, and Pierre Alexander Jean was able to show his mettle, didn't crack under the pressure. No, he did a very, very good job indeed. I know he was disappointed, he expressed that disappointment after his qualifying <laughs> session on Saturday afternoon. But look at that, emotion. Go on, go on, guys, Brilliant. let it go. Brilliant. So after a couple of seasons in the privateer CMR Bentley, they've made the step to really the top Ferrari team. AF Corsa and uh, a brilliant job. Charles Weir, it's really nice to see. He's the first one from anywhere other than their own team to come across and say well done. He knows what it feels like to have that first GT win and although he's only second, and there's Vincent Voss, the team principal with Dries Van Thorpe, they gave it the best shot. They, 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 he certainly drove the wheels off the Audi and yeah. that stint he had, I mean you can see how hard he's working, the poor guy is absolutely drained. Absolutely. Right, let's hear then from Pierre-Alexander Jean and Ulysse de Pau, winners of our first Sprint Cup race of the year. PA, still just getting your helmet off and celebrations. Absolutely wonderful to see the both of you so excited. Ulysse, you drove the incredible stint there and it was hard for you to watch that second stint. Yeah, it's uh, I'm over the moon. It's uh, simply amazing. Uh, the car was perfect. Uh, it's the perfect scenario for us to start the championship like that. Uh, hats off to uh, IF Corsair for a stunning car and uh, PA for finishing the job and uh, kept the other under pressure, so uh, I'm out of world. I know you can get your winner's hat on. <laughs> well yeah, done, it's important. Uh, Do you know what, as you were up. coming into here in Park Ferme, I could hear you screaming within the car. <laughs> and you know what, last year in Manico, I told you every time that it, I eat egg in the morning, it works. I eat egg this morning with my, uh, with my teammate and apparently it works correctly, so yeah, very happy. What a race, what a race. Uh, congrats to this guy who did uh, a very, very good job starting pole, get, get away and give me a perfect car. So after I just had to put some laps, be careful about track limit. And uh, yeah, when this race on the first race of the season is uh, is quite good. We still have a long season ahead, but uh, it's good to start like this. How much pressure were you under? That gap between yourself and Dries Van Tour behind you was closing in. Yeah, it was closing in, but uh, honestly, I was feeling great in the in the car. The car is, is very, very good. You, it helps you to make no mistakes. So, yeah, I was uh, keeping my race correctly. No mistake, no track limit, and the uh, pressure was OK. Thank you both. Well done. Congratulations. Yeah. So well done to Pierre-Alexandre-Jean and to Ulysse de Pau. And to A, of course, that operates a great team and a great car. You know what? I'm going to have an English egg for breakfast every morning. <laughs> what can I achieve? <laughs> the mind boggles. <laughs> so, British eggs guide French driver to victory. Uh, Pierre Alexander Jean, victorious at Brands Hatch. Well, what about the thoughts of Dries Van Thor and Charles Weir? They finished second and then with Gemma.
Joyce, let's come to you first. The pressure you were putting on there was incredible, but also feeling it behind you with Marcello, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, it was quite tricky, I must say. Uh, I tried as much as I could, but I couldn't follow the Ferrari uh, a bit too quick for, for me, at least. Um, and then, yeah, Marcello behind me trying to uh, trying to get past. It was a lovely stint, but uh, yeah, it was not easy for us. Um, <clears throat> car is a bit tricky at the moment for us, so uh, it was not the most relaxed stint I've ever had, I think. But uh, we made it, so we got good points again, starting P5, finishing second. So it's a good it's a good start. It's certainly a good start. What are you struggling with on the car? <laughs> well, just general balance and uh, overall speed compared to to the others. But yeah, here's the thing, uh, even though it's not especially our best track and we know that we are, uh, at least in terms of, of pace, not the, not the fastest, uh, we still managed to be second thanks to an amazing job of the guys again in the pit stop. Uh, we could get some, uh, some places there because it's almost impossible to overtake on track unless, unless you're five times faster, which we are not. Uh, so yeah, big thank you to WRT and it's a good way to start the season. Thank you very much, boys. Well done. So, whatever they've learnt from race one at WRT, they will factor in to trying to improve the setup of the car for race two. You rule them out at your peril, and as we were saying during the course of the race, once more, the speed of the pit stop helping to bring that car up into uh, second position, gaining places on the pit stops. So let's look at the provisional results of the opening Sprint Cup race of the Fanatec GT season. A win for Ulysse de Pau and Pierre-Alexander Jean, ahead of Charles Wins and Dries Van Thor. Timor Bogostowski and Raffaele Marcello third, ahead of Jules Gounon and Jim Clark with Aurelien Panis uh, fifth. And Patrick Niederhauser uh, with a top six, rounded out by Matteo Drudi and Luca Giotto. Uh, the class winners, as well as we've been saying, uh, silver to the outright winners of UDP and PAJ. The winning pros, Charles Wirtz and Dries Van Thor, and you go down to uh, 14th place and find Hugo Delacour and Cedric Sprazzuoli as the winners of Pro-Am. And of course, quite a few hard luck stories, both dynamic Porsches we lost with different incidents and two of the WRT Audi fleet at Turn 1, Jean-Baptiste Simonau and Benji Goethe off in the incident that gave Mercedes 86 of Igor Walilko that 10-second stop-go penalty. So let's have a look at the highlights of that uh, opening round of the championship. As it all kicked off on the run towards the first corner. Will go spinning one way, the two Audis tagged the other. And actually, Edwin Delina's Porsche had got itself into the back of slowing traffic and then had its own spin. But the net result was a long safety car period as everybody had to try and sort themselves out for the dramas at the first corner. When the race got underway proper. It was a good lead for Ulysse and Depau as he was able to charge clear of the opposition. Some good battles raged on lower down the field as well. Jim Clark was getting ready to take over from Jules Gounon as we had Giorgio Rola's spin coming out of Sheen Curve. Not his only one of the race. Eddie Cheever had made progress in the Sky Tempest of Mercedes but soon came under attack as the pit window opened and the teams cycled their way through the stops. Valentino Rossi gave way to Fred Bermiche as Dries Van Thorpe carved his way through the field, at least to Powell stopped a little bit later in the window, hung on to the race lead as Raffaele Marchiello went round the outside of Luca Giotto and gained a place. But a bad pit stop for the ASP team with a left rear wheel that just would not seem to cost them two places and made Jules Gounon decidedly frustrated. Raffaele Marchiello was on for the fastest lap of the race and he soon caught up with Dries Van Thorpe for second but could not find a way past him. Van Thorpe equally struggling to get right onto terms with the race leading Ferrari. Good battle for Pro-Am as Christian Kleen fended off Andrea Bertolini for second place. But as the cars accelerated up towards the chequered flag, it was a win for AF Corsa, a win for Ferrari, for Elise Depau and for Pierre Alexandre Jean. Delight at AF Corsa and the two Silver Cup drivers conquer the pros in the first Sprint Cup race of the year. So the podium is being made ready. And as soon as the SRO officials are happy, then the drivers will be brought forward and uh, then the celebrations will be underway. So the uh, Pro Cup drivers being brought forward first. And uh, Timo Bogostowski and Raffaele Marciello, the third overall. Dries Van Thor and Charles Wirtz come forward for second place. 
and the top step of the Brands Hatch podium will go the way of Ulysse de Pau and for Pierre Alexander Jean, who is absolutely overjoyed. As there he is, he steps forward. Ulysse de Pau onto the podium as well. I think we talked about what odds you'd have got for pole position for them yesterday. John said they were long odds. Well, a race win. Brilliant job. We rather thought that UDP might get swamped on the run of the first corner, but a brilliant job by the pair of them. So the trophies will be presented, but first of all, the uh, AF course, the representative will head there as well. But a great job done, really was, by the AF course team. Just look at the difference in heights between the two lead, two win drivers. Yeah. That also is a contribution. Pit stop, you've got to get the seat adjusted as well. Indeed, so trophies then to Timo Bogoslavski, now to Raffaele Marciello, former Formula 3 Euro Series champion, very much one of your go to Mercedes GT drivers. And then for second place, Dries van Thor and Charles Wirtz will receive the trophies. Charles Wirtz and Dries van Thor, winners here last year and Sprint Cup champions for the last two seasons. So, again, they know how to bank points. They had a win in the opening Endurance Cup race with Kelvin van der Linde at Imola. Uh, there is, of course, the combined, the overall championship. You take the points from Sprint and Endurance together. But uh, that's not yet relevant, really, given that we've only had uh, one race of Sprint. So uh, very little from the Sprint Cup to factor in just yet. But the outright win goes to the taller Ulysse de Pau. Of course, a regular out of Jonathan Palmer's uh, British Formula 3 Championship a few seasons back. And to Pierre-Alexander Jean, who receives his winner's trophy now as well. AF Corsa's rep with them on the podium. And uh, the Ferrari team very, very pleased indeed with what has been a great result. The AF Corsa squad wins at Brands Hatch. So for AF Corsa, the national anthem and the celebrations underway as the champagne is sprayed at Brands Hatch. Judice de Pau and Pierre-Alexandre Jean, the race winners. It was perhaps a surprise victory, but it was very well deserved. Pole position set by Ulysse de Pau and the great job that he did, backed up by a great stint by Pierre-Alexandre Jean, both of them praising the car and a much overdue sprint cut win for Ferraris. I say go back to 2015 and Misano for the last one outstanding stuff so what does all that do to the sprint cup championship it means obviously that the race results is the uh, order in the standing 17 and a half points to at least to pound pierre alexander jean ahead of charles wirtz dries van thor with timor bogostowski and Raffaele marciello in third place it's going on on par fourth from niederhauser on panis and rudy and giotto are in sixth at least to power of course also uh, will be victorious with Pierre-Alexandre Jean in the Silver Cup, and they also get their extra point for pole position in the class as well. So as far as the Drivers' Championship is concerned, the Ferrari has put down a marker, and it'll be a grid which is based on the uh, second 
uh, qualifying session rather than race results for when we get to that second race later in the day. Dennis Marshall and Alex Arca step forward for third place in the Silver Cup. For second place, Tom Adrue and Casper Stevenson, Mercedes drivers both, step forward. So for third Audi, for second Mercedes, and of course it's Ferrari that wins in silver. They've been here before, they're back again. Pierre Alexander Jean and Elise de Pau step forward as the Silver Cup victors. Onto the podium they go, and it's going to be AF Corsa once more represented as the winning team. And the trophies will be brought forward in a moment to be given to our winning Silver Cup drivers. They are trophies presented by Pirelli. Two out of two for Pierre Alexander Jean and Elise de Pau, I think is a tall order overall, but they might do two out of two in silver. And we'll find out about that second race a little bit later on in the afternoon because the second race is due to get underway at 16.45. Join us for that if you can, because it promises to be another thriller. As Mathieu Braga from Pirelli hands over the trophies and we'll see you at Brands Hatch later this afternoon. For now, from John Watson and David Addison, it's goodbye.